Well, I'd just like to add to what uh, Nick and Philip have already said about uh, the late Malcolm Molyneux, who sadly died on Tuesday night. He was a, a marvellous friend of 40 years, an incredible clinician and investigator and a, a really marvellous and outstanding person. We're so sorry to have lost him. Uh, so my title um, is from the, the words of the, uh, the, the former uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, and I'd certainly never heard of this particular um, crisis of public health. Before I began to work in West Africa, I went from Hammersmith Hospital to a new medical school, Am Amadou Bello University in Zaria, in northern Nigeria in 1970. Uh, to study epidemic meningococcal meningitis. This was the dry Guinea savanna uh, of northern Nigeria. After being there for about 18 months, I had a really life-changing experience. I was on take midnight uh, in December 1971, when a 50-year-old house of farmer was transferred from our country branch in Malamfashi, about 55 miles away, uh, the story was that three days earlier, he'd been bitten by a snake, which he called Gajira, while farming. Uh, he noticed immediate pain in the bitten part with some swelling. He'd treated himself at home using a, tr a tried and trusted herbal remedy. But after two hours, the swelling, swelling had spread up his leg. And after 12 hours, he had pain in the lower back and abdomen, and he was passing blood per urethra. He spent a miserable next two to three days at home, feeling increasingly awful. He was faint and sweaty when he tried to sit up, and he finally decided to seek medical help. Uh, when I examined him on admission, he appeared virtually moribund. Uh, he had a swollen, tender ankle. He was very pale, hemoglobin only 2.5 um, um, grams per deciliter, uh, low blood pressure with a rapid pulse, and he fainted on sitting up. He had an, a distended and tender abdomen. <clears throat> and sure enough, there was a drop of blood at his urethral meatus. Well, I resuscitated him by putting him head down, feet up, and starting intravenous fluid. <clears throat> and as one would with a, an unfamiliar medical problem, I tried to get help from my medical colleagues but was most surprised that none of them seemed to know anything about snake bite, which raised the question, was snake bite really so rare in this area? I made then a rather naive observation. I'd taken blood for cross-matching into a glass vessel, and after 30, 30 minutes, I thought, funny, it hasn't clotted yet, so how am I going to get some serum? Um, I knew that there was a, an antidote to envenoming called antivenom, but our pharmacy only had one uh, vial from the Pasteur antivenom, uh, I think from their museum. It was desiccated and long expired. Well, tragically, this poor man died seven hours after admission before blood was available for transfusion. It's an awful experience to sit with a patient and preside over a death from, from hemorrhagic shock. And the autopsy, uh, revealed really extensive bleeding in every part of the body. So this tragic case raised a whole lot of questions. First of all, what on earth was Gajira, this snake? How important was snake bite in Nigeria? Was this a, just a rare one-off? And what could be the pathophysiology, the mechanism of such disastrous envenoming? Uh, which venom toxins might be uh, involved? And were there specific antidotes or antivenoms available in Nigeria? If so, how effective and safe were they? Well, I quickly found out which snake this was. This Gajira was the, uh, one of the West African carpet vipers, now called Echis romani. It's not a particularly impressive looking snake. It's really more than about 30 or 40 centimeters in total length. And it's sort of earth colored. It's certainly not dramatic. I then um, did a sort of anecdotal epidemiology survey. I asked absolutely everyone I met about snakes and snake bites. You can imagine what a bore I became. And I discovered that in many rural areas of the north of Nigeria, 
uh, people had lost close relatives to snake bite in recent years. It was clear that snake bite victims didn't bother to go to hospitals or dispensaries unless uh, they could expect to get some effective treatment there, such as um, antivenom. And this probably explains why they're, they're, no one in our hospital seemed to know anything about snake bite. The patients just didn't come because they qu quite sensibly realized that there was nothing there for them. I did discover from my um, sort of anecdotal survey that um, there was a hospital, a, a former Sudan interior mission hospital up in the northeast in Kaltungo, where it was reported that half a dozen or so snake bite patients turned up most evenings. Very appetizing for someone looking for a suitable site to do clinical studies of snake bite. This was this very attractive area of Kaltungo. The village is, is overseen by Tangali Peak there. And this is the hospital, a fairly simple um, African district hospital. Well, on the clinical side, um, over the next few years, uh, working for periods in Kaltungo Hospital, I saw a lot of patients and I learned a lot about the effects of envenoming uh, in patients. Most of the victims seem to be, have been bitten by carpet vipers. And certainly most of the deaths reported from the area were attributable to carpet vipers. So you hear, see here some of the um, clinical effects of envenoming from the local swelling and blistering to bleeding, spontaneous bleeding from the gums, uh, the local effects which can end up with necrosis, requiring surgical intervention, debridement. This boy has got a, <clears throat> a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and um, you'll see what a predominance of children, a preponderance of children there are among, among these patients. Well, with the help of laboratory colleagues in, in Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and elsewhere, uh, we were able to develop some idea about how the venom of the carpet viper could cause such a, an appalling hemorrhagic diathesis as in the fatal case that introduced me to this topic. First of all, the venom contains um, some procoagulant serine proteases, which stimulate the uh, clotting cascade, eventually leading to uh, production of fibrin, which is instantly broken down by the body's fibrinolytic system. A second antihemostatic effect are these hemorrhagins or zinc metalloproteinases, which damage the endothelial lining of blood vessels. So this electron microscope, microscope picture, this is the lumen of a small blood vessel. And here is an erythrocyte spurting through the junction of two adjacent endothelial cells uh, opened up under the effect of a snake venom uh, hemorrhagin. And this shows the composition of these uh, uh, metalloproteinases, which I'll come back to later. And the third very important anti-hemostatic effect of carpet viper venom is on um, platelets. The C-type lectins activate and inhibit uh, blood platelets. So all these three mechanisms acting in concert uh, could produce fatal hemorrhage. Well, more recent techniques, such as the application of proteomics uh, to um, toxinology, has revealed an, a much more complex structure of well, all snake venoms, including carpet viper venom. See that on reverse phase HPLC separation, there are at least 43 identifiable peaks. And um, in this schema of the uh, proteome or venome of carpet viper venom, you see that uh, the, the bulk of the venom toxins are zinc, um, zinc metalloproteinases uh, of four different classes. And the known effects of these metalloproteinases include damage to <clears throat> capillary basement membranes, causing local and systemic bleeding. They also damage muscle locally and systemically, and they cause blistering and uh, edema. They inhibit platelet aggregation, and they also have a procoagulant activation of um, factor 10, uh, contributing to the coagulopathy. Well, it was quite clear from our studies in Kaltungo that there was something of an antivenom crisis, certainly in Nigeria and through correspondence through the west of Africa. 
Our small observational studies show that at least one antivenom that could be obtained on the market, this one was made in South Africa, the South African Institute of Medical Research, was highly effective in uh, neutralizing and reversing effects of carpet viper venom. But unfortunately, it was too expensive and not widely available in those days, in the 70s, the import of South African products was uh, complicated by the apartheid business. Uh, a new antivenom was needed, but how did one go about this? Well, a colleague of mine at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, David Theakston, and I decided that we would go public on this. So we wrote a letter to The Lancet entitled A Crisis in Snake Antivenom Supply for Africa. And I'm glad to say that this was seemed to be widely read. And we also approached many international antivenom manufacturers, different countries, um, Europe and so on, uh, to consider developing a new carpet viper antivenom. So how do you go about producing an antivenom? Well, first of all, you need to catch some snakes of the right sort. So this was uh, our team of snake catchers in northern Nigeria looking for carpet vipers. Then you need to milk venom from the snakes and then you hyperimmunize some uh, cooperative horses with increasing doses. And from their um, plasma, you refine uh, immunoglobulin. And uh, then it's ready for intravenous uh, preparing, preparing the drug, which is given by intravenous uh, injection to the snake bite victim. We were extremely lucky to, find, to get support in Nigeria from a very sympathetic um, Minister of Health, Professor Olikoi Ransom Kuti, who was a, a former professor of paediatrics, extremely helpful, and a senior member of the Federal Ministry of Health, Dr. Absulami Nasidi. And crucially, we attracted the support of two very good antivenom producers, one in the United Kingdom, Microfarm, who um, raised their antivenoms in Welsh sheep, and another in Costa Rica. And uh, with their help, we designed a new antivenom. We tested it preclinically uh, in the laboratory, and we carried out a large uh, non-inferiority comparative trial, um, phase one and two to three. Um, and we then encouraged the manufacture and distribution of two new carpet viper antivenoms for West Africa. And this shows the, the sort of team, very important to get local support. This is the chief of Tangali, the ch traditional uh, chief, uh, Islamic chief of this area with Tangali Peak in the background and colleagues from, from Liverpool, David Theakston and from, from Nigeria and Professor now Professor Abdul Razak Habib, who um, helped uh, coordinate the trial in Nigeria. Well, after Nigeria, I went back to Oxford for a while and was then uh, given the opportunity to start a new unit in Thailand, as you've heard from Nick Day. This was the Welcome Mahidon University Oxford Tropical Medicine Research Unit. So I moved from snowy Oxford one winter uh, to, to Bangkok and became very interested in the uh, occupational problems of snake bite amongst particularly rice workers. Um, in uh, the central rice growing area of Thailand. I was working in eastern Thailand. Actually, it was the site we'd discovered to work on cerebral malaria. That was the main uh, subject of my research in, in uh, Thailand at that stage, in Jantaburi. When I admitted a 13-year-old boy who'd been bitten while he was asleep on the floor of his house uh, in a rural area near Jantaburi. And the snake was killed and I could identify it. It was a Malayan crate, uh, quite a large snake, over a meter long. Here are the marks made by the upper and lower jaw teeth on his thigh. These are the marks made by the venom fangs. Uh, within three hours, he was showing early signs of neurotoxicity, of interruption of neuromuscular transmission caused by pre and postsynaptic neurotoxins in the venom. See, he's been go, to go a bit dusky and cyanosed as his respiratory muscles are involved. 
After a further hour, these symptoms are worse. He's clearly got facial paralysis. Now there's descending paralysis of muscles innervated by the cranial nerves. And at this stage, he's unable to open his mouth um, and protrude his tongue. Um, we've intubated him when he was unable to breathe. And this is at nine hours. And um, here he is being manually ventilated. He was manually ventilated for 49 hours before he could be weaned off uh, this assisted ventilation. I'm glad to say the outcome was very good. Here he is uh, leaving hospital after six days. But this was a tremendous surprise because no one seemed to know about this snake. We decided to undertake a national survey of this to find out what sorts of snakes were biting people in different parts of Thailand. And we were just using the, the dead snakes brought in by patients uh, that had been bitten by these snakes at these 80 different district and provincial hospitals. We collected the dead snakes over a period of about two or three years. To our surprise, we found that 13 out of 46 fatal cases where we had the dead snake as evidence of causation were caused by this pretty well unknown snake, the Malayan crepe, the same one who'd, been, who'd bitten that 13-year-old boy. The snake seemed to be virtually unknown, possibly because it's an exclusively nocturnal snake. And there was no antivenom available because, of, as I say, it hadn't been recognized as an important cause of snake bite. The survey um, brought to light another problem. Uh, in the central rice growing part of Thailand, shown here dashed in red, there are three different snakes, uh, green pit vipers, Russell's viper and Malayan pit viper, that all cause the same clinical syndrome of combination of local swelling with bleeding and coagulopathy. So that, and if the patient, as in the majority of cases, the patient wasn't able to identify the snake that had bitten them, uh, it was very difficult for the clinician to know what to do because the antivenoms available at that stage back in the uh, 1980s were only monospecific, monospecific for each of these species. These antivenoms did not have cross neutralization of other viper venoms. So you can see the difficulty. It's a matter of guesswork based on inadequate evidence. Fortunately, uh, the results of our research became known to the excellent uh, national manufacturer of antivenom, the Thai Red Cross Society, based in the beautiful Queen Sawapa Memorial Institute in Bangkok. And uh, they were encouraged to produce a polyvalent to cover the three different viper venoms. So Russell's green pit viper and Malayan pit viper, the clinician no longer had to guess. Uh, he or she could use this polyvalent to cover all three. And in the case of the Malayan crate, they not only produced a monospecific antivenom to cover this newly recognized major cause of snake bite death in Thailand, but they also combined its venom in production of a neuropolyvalent antivenom that covered other neurotoxic species, such as the uh, uh, common cobra and the king cobra. Well, I was very keen to go to Burma because. I knew that from pre-independence days, from the uh, 1930s, Burma was notorious for its very high rates of snake bite mortality. Do you see here in these black areas, uh, 16 or more deaths per 100,000 inhabitants per year caused by snake bite. And I got the opportunity in the early 1980s to collaborate with the Department of Medical Research in Yangon, which was a short flight from Bangkok, and um, to start a research unit uh, combining work on snake bite and, and malaria in this um, township medical hospital, uh, Tayawadi, uh, north of Yangon. So here's a fairly simple colonial hospital uh, serving um, a paddy growing area. See the, the uh, rice farmers highly exposed to snake bite as they, um, particularly when they gather the crop, the paddy crop, barefooted and barehanded. And I was supported by a very strong team from the Department of Medical Research led by its brilliant director, Dr. Antan Batu. 
The main problem here was Russell's viper, which was believed to be responsible for almost all the bites and deaths in the central area of, of Burma. And this is a typical patient of ours during the work we did in Dayawadi. Um, this rice farmer bitten while he bitten on the foot while he was uh, working in the rice fields. Um, he collapses, he's brought in unconscious, hypotensive, and the research team here uh, gathered around um, giving him antivenom and taking baseline blood samples. And here is the, 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 the worried uh, neighbor of his giving, helping us with the clinical history. Well, some of the effects, the devastating effects of Russell's viper envenoming are illustrated now. Fatal cerebral hemorrhage, um, disseminated intravascular coagulation involving deposition of fibrin in the lungs, also in the anterior pituitary. This is the a section of the adenopituitary causing acute and chronic uh, panhypopituitarism. Uh, most important, a development of acute kidney injury by various mechanisms including ischemia by the deposition of fibrin stayed red here in the peritubular vessels. And finally, um, a late development of the syndrome of generalized increase in capillary permeability uh, revealed clinically by this sign of chemosis or conjunctival edema followed by hemorrhage. In subsequent years, I was able to pursue my interest in snake bite uh, by working in Sri Lanka, in Papua New Guinea, Bangladesh, and in various countries in, in, in uh, Latin America. And I certainly confirmed the, the idea that snake bite is an utterly fascinating and clinically challenging problem. But how important was it? Was it really, as um, Kofi Annan had suggested, the biggest public health crisis you've never heard, heard of? The problem is that Estimates of snake bite morbidity and mortality <clears throat> tended to be based largely on hospital records. And uh, as we know, in rural areas of uh, low middle income countries, snake bite deaths often occur at home, um, uncertified, undocumented. So what was urgently needed was a community based survey to try and make a stronger case that snake bite was worth taking notice of and worth considering as a disease of public health importance. I was very fortunate in Oxford. I've been talking to Richard Pito about my, my interest in, in snake bite. And he introduced me to Dr. Prabhat Jha of the University of Toronto, who had helped to develop the Registrar General of India's Million Death Study, uh, which ran from 1998 to 2014. Um, this was, this was reckoned to be um, uh, uh, the largest um, uh, epidemiological survey based on community studies um, uh, ever attempted. And um, it wasn't designed for snake bite. Of course, it was designed to look at the health burden of tobacco related diseases and, and malaria and various other diseases. But I managed to persuade Prabhat Jar to include some questions in his, um, in his analysis dealing with snake bite. Um, the cause of death in this study was based on verbal autopsy, which is a potentially a controversial technique. Uh, this involves questioning relatives and neighbors of the deceased to identify the cause of death. And uh, it involved uh, nearly 7,000 randomly chosen sample areas throughout the whole of India, each one about 1,000 people each. And this covered the whole country. It was independent of hospital underreporting. Here are the people questioning uh, relatives. And um, the results were really quite extraordinary. Uh, deaths attributable to snake bite in India. And by the way, I think this attribution is likely to be reliable in the case of snake bite because uh, snake bite is such a dramatic and memorable uh, for mode of death that it's highly likely that relatives and neighbors will remember. Um, anyway, the, the estimate was of 46,000 uh, snake bite deaths in India in the year 2005. These are the 99% confidence intervals. So snake bite caused one death for every maternal death in India and for every two HIV AIDS deaths. 
A lot were in children, and the this estimate was more than 20 times the official government of India's figure based on unrepresentative hospital data. And because it was a nationwide study, it was possible to see the relative burden of snake bite in different states of, of India and therefore deploy uh, scarce resources uh, more appropriately. These data helped to persuade WHO to recognize snake bite as a priority neglected tropical disease and subsequently to persuade the Wellcome Trust and other international funding agencies to make generous uh, provision for snake bite research. The update of the million death study, which was published last year, suggests that the uh, number of snake bite deaths in India is, has been as high as 58,000 a year um, during this period, amounting to 1.2 million snake bite deaths and was increasing. So I believe that um, these data have vindicated Kofi Annan's suggestion that snake bite was the biggest public health crisis you've never heard of. Thank you for your attention.